morning, everyone, and welcome to New Hope Presbyterian Church's service of worship. I know that uh, many of us are excited that the governor has recently relaxed some of his restrictions on uh, the number of us who can gather together indoors to worship. Uh, we can have as many as uh, 50 people or 25% uh, of our building capacity, which for us will be uh, 50 people, and so we're excited about that. Also, uh, as many as 100 can gather together, worship outside, so we're very thankful for that. We feel like things are moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, nevertheless, there are a number of details uh, still to be uh, worked out. Uh, for example, if we were to begin a resume worshiping together inside, we would still need to wear masks, and that presents certain challenges and singing, of course, and if we were to uh, gather in groups of 100 outdoors, especially as we're in the middle of a neighborhood, that presents certain logistical challenges as well. So please be patient with us. The elders will be meeting uh, this week and we'll be working on this issue and, and uh, deciding how best to uh, move forward. And so just watch your emails and we'll keep you updated as, as things develop. But we are excited to announce that uh, we're going to be hosting a modified art camp this summer. Obviously, we can't host art camp the way we normally do. Uh, it just wouldn't be uh, realistic or practical, but a number of our ladies have been working on this, and they're going to be preparing uh, gift boxes for the kids uh, filled with all sorts of goodies and surprises, including some art supplies. And we'll have certain days when families can come and pick them up and take them home. And then there'll be certain uh, weeks in July uh, that our ladies will be offering um, art lessons online with the kids. We'll also have a, a online read-alongs of a book called The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. It's part of the Chronicles of Narnia a series, and so one of the goodies in the box is going to be a little essay explaining the Christian a symbolism of the Chronicles of Narnia, and uh, our ladies are anticipating some good time of discussion with the kids, where they'll be able to interact and talk about it, and so we're really excited. We're thankful the, the, the women have been so uh, creative and um, we agreed that a lot of the kids have been cooped up alongside, along, uh, inside for a long time, and we thought we may only get five or six kids. But we thought if we get five or six kids, that, that's great. We're excited. Well, we first sent out our first email uh, yesterday, and we already have uh, more than 20 kids signed up in the first day. So we're really excited, and we'll, we'll let you know more as we get closer along, but ask you just to keep that in, in your prayers, uh, that God would bless this effort to reach out to uh, some of the kids and families uh, in our community. And we're also excited to have Pastor Tom Church with us this morning. Tom is a recently retired uh, pastor of our OPC Church in Emmanuel Belmar, and it's a pleasure to have Tom bringing us a God's Word this morning. I'm going to ask you now, if you will, please rise and hear the call to worship from Matthew chapter 6, as uh, we are encouraged to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Uh, this is God's Word. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'm going to ask you now, if you will, please bow your head and join with me in prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we confess we have been anxious and concerned about the wrong things. We've been too concerned about all the little things that you know that we need and too little concerned about the things that matter most. Father, we come this morning to put you first, to seek you first, to honor you, to worship you, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, we ask you, Lord, to receive us this morning and receive our worship. For we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Last well, now, if you will, please remain standing and we'll be singing verses 1, 4, and 6. Verses 1, 4, and 6 of O Worship the King. Shield and defender 
seated and I'll ask you again if you would please bow your head and join with me uh, in a word of prayer let's pray together father in heaven uh, days have turned into weeks and weeks have turned into months and we wonder how long uh, this is going to go on and yet life does go on uh, in its own way and we thank you for that we praise you for of the sunshine, for the coming of summer, for the prospect of returning uh, to some measure of normalcy, whatever that might look like. We pray for peace in our land. Father, we pray for humility and love, for mutual understanding, respect, for moderation, compassion. Lord, we pray for justice and fairness and safety we pray for wisdom for health for respect for those in authority we pray for safety for our police officers and for those they've sworn to protect we pray for wisdom for our president for our governor and for all those in authority most of all lord we pray for you for your glory, for your honor, that your name would be treasured, that the name of Jesus might be exalted and lifted up, that during this time of, of, of weakness, of, of division, of acrimony, that in spite of and perhaps even because of all the troubles in the world, uh, your kingdom might grow, that your church might swell, that your people might prosper, that you might be pleased to pour out your blessing on us and use us, that we might reflect more of your uh, divine character and your nature. Lord, that we might be gracious and, and wise and, and moderate and loving and, and, and patient, that we might be servants, that we might be great lovers of, of men and, and good neighbors to one another. We pray, O oh Lord, that the goodness and the grace and, and the mercy and the kindness of Jesus Christ would be uh, evident even during these times, Lord. We pray that you would bless your word as it goes out. We pray that you'd bless our witness and our, and our testimony. We pray that you'd bring many to love and adore and praise you. Father, we also offer you our gifts this morning. Pray that you might receive them and bless them and use them and consecrate them to your purpose, Lord that your name uh, might be heard and loved and served and obeyed and adored from sea to sea. Lord, we pray that you would use our efforts and the efforts of others to advance your kingdom, to win the loss, to bring hope, to, to bring healing, to bring reconciliation, to strengthen families. Lord, we pray for our children. We pray for our marriages. We pray for the relationships between the parents and their kids and between parents and their older parents. We pray, O oh Lord, for strong families and for those who are without family. Lord, we pray for the church family that even while we are separated by, by space, that nevertheless our, the bonds between us might grow. We pray, O oh Lord, you would forgive us our sins for they are many. And pray, O oh Lord, that you might cover us with the righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you might hear our prayers and lift us up. For we worship you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. And now uh, Pastor Tom Church is going to come forward and bring God's word to us. morning. <clears throat> Recently, um, two paintings by Paul Gauguin, valued somewhere between 14 and 40 million dollars, were stolen, for which museum detectives had been searching for decades and were finally discovered um, they had been left on a train and placed in the lost and found and eventually purchased by an Italian auto worker for about $100 who put them in his kitchen because one of them, a still life of painted fruit, fit with his decor. A lost Van Gogh worth tens of millions was discovered in the attic of a Norwegian man who thought they were worthless. A $137 million painting by Caravaggio was discovered when someone was investigating a, a water leak in another attic, this in a house in Toulouse, in France. And uh, a $300, uh, $300 million Michelangelo was discovered stuffed behind a sofa in Buffalo, New York, after a tennis ball had knocked the picture off the wall. Sometimes, we discover something surpassing wonderful that we were never even looking for. At other times, we're surprised to discover something we were looking for, but are amazed and thrilled to have found it and, and how absolutely invaluable it is once it's in our hands. An introduction to the familiar twin parable, usually known as the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. Let's read them. You'll need to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13 and follow along as I read this portion of God's Word. Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Lord our God, open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law. Well, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, of heaven. He, he likens the kingdom of heaven to something of surpassing value that must be found. So, what is the kingdom of heaven? In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells us to pray to the Father, your kingdom come. Now, what does that mean? What are we asking when we pray for uh, God's kingdom to come? Well, it turns out we're asking for something both heavenly and earthly. On one hand, to pray for the kingdom of heaven is to desire heaven itself and all of its fullness and all of its blessing and all of its beauty and all of its eternal security. And the kingdom of heaven is the king, uh, the savior, and the holy trinity himself. To have the kingdom of heaven is to have all of the blessings of the presence and the pleasure of the king smiling upon us, embracing us, drying our eyes and smoothing back our hair. To have the kingdom of heaven is to escape the second death of judgment. It's the promise of a new body reunited to our tired souls, made perfect in a place where life never ends. To possess the kingdom is to possess the assurance that the moment of our earthly death, we pass instantly into the presence of the Lord Jesus. That's our future treasure. But finding the kingdom is not something 
altogether heavenly or otherworldly. It's, it's not altogether a future thing. It's very much a present thing. We can possess the kingdom to a wonderful degree even now in this life because when you find the king, you also find the kingdom. If you have Jesus, you have priceless treasure. To have the uh, treasure of the kingdom is to know and be known by King Jesus. To possess the gift of his love, his righteousness, his forgiveness, his eternal uh, kingship and friendship. To, to have the kingdom is to have God the Holy Spirit in our hearts, which is in fact only a down payment of the fullness of the kingdom blessings to come. Now in this age in which we live, the kingdom of heaven is manifested in many ways by the church, by the people of God, by the community of believers. So that when a man is saved and finds the kingdom, or more correctly is found by the king and inducted into the kingdom, one of the ways that plays itself out for us is that we're brought into the visible church. We're brought into the protection and the blessing and the fellowship and the worship and the prayer and the nurture of the congregation of God's people. Uh, maybe it'll help to think of it this way. When God created the heavens and the earth on the sixth day, he created man and woman and he created them for himself. That was his purpose of us, to be created that we might worship and enjoy him. That is the overarching purpose of life, to worship and enjoy God. And since, ever since then, no man or woman uh, has ever been happier than when they're in a saving, worshipful relationship with God. Now, we spoiled that relationship uh, in our rejection of God's rule over our lives, which threw us out of relationship with God and brought us under his judgment. But God, uh, the loving Father, who seeks to, uh, to bring us back to himself, does so through the loving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, to have the kingdom is to be restored to a loving, living relationship with the king and all that goes with that uh, in this earthly life and in the heavenly life to come. And that's why you may sometimes hear people speak of the kingdom of heaven as both the now and the not yet. We enjoy it now on earth as Christians and we'll enjoy it all the more uh, in the future in its completion in heaven. Which brings me to the second thing. Having identified the existence of the kingdom, both earthly and heavenly, we need next to be sure we recognize the immeasurable value of the kingdom, the value of this kingdom. And in both parables, each of the men uh, see or discover something they regard as being very valuable. They each recognize its value, uh, an outrageous treasure, a pearl of great price. But how many people you know have, uh, have Jesus and his gospel and heaven offered to them uh, and, and they stumble upon it. They have no idea. They have no appreciation what's before them at all. In my opening illustration, I mentioned these people who owned a Michelangelo painting. Imagine owning a painting by Michelangelo and um, uh, they saw his name on it. They, they just figured it was a copy and they apparently jokingly called the picture the mic. Um, and, uh, but they had no idea of what they possessed. And when someone knocked the picture off the wall and broke its frame with a, pen, uh, the a tennis ball, they just stuffed it behind the sofa. They did not recognize the value of the treasure that had been hanging up in plain view for years. And you and I, have surely known people who have brushed away any discussion about Jesus and the kingdom of God with, with careless uh, disinterest uh, and a very sort of supercilious attitude. They, they don't recognize it as being something of serious value at all. Now, we understand that this treasure, the king and his heavenly kingdom, at this point in time, is largely manifested uh, in a spiritual manner. And as precious as it is uh, to us, we know that 
spiritual treasure is, is hard for the unbeliever to recognize because they can't actually see it. And the reason they can't see it in large part is because they're spiritually dead in their sin. They're unconverted. A man or a woman who's not converted is dead in sin, and, and part of that deadness is a spiritual blindness that makes them devalue the kingdom of heaven, which sounds sort of very philosophical and, and religious and churchy and, and pretty useless in this life. Only when God the Holy Spirit regenerates our, us, our, regenerates our sin deadened heart and makes us spiritually alive, we begin to see how precious the kingdom really is and how precious Jesus is. Precious to the point that people give up their very lives to forfeit, uh, rather, rather than forfeit the kingdom by uh, denying the Lord Jesus. A man being held, uh, maybe being held up, stuck up in a dark a street corner uh, and required to give up his wallet with his cash and credit cards and, and identity information, it would be wise to just hand over the, uh, the, the wallet rather than risk their life. But Christians have often refused uh, to, um, to give up their faith, to hand over their good confession of the Lord Jesus, even at the cost of their lives. Many thousands have been martyred for their faith rather than to denounce the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christians do this not because they're so brave and special or fanatical, but simply out of, out of love and fidelity to the Lord. And it's because they understand something of the remarkable, lasting, eternal value of having Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. They're not fools at all. They're simply making a wise bargain, if you'll put it that way. But outside of the grace of God working in our hearts and opening our eyes to spiritual reality and truth, there's nothing that seems very valuable about the kingdom of heaven at all, is there? And that's why we, we pray for our friends and our neighbors. Open their eyes, Lord. They don't see it. You need to work in their heart to, to show them yourself, to convert them. And we should do that, and we should be praying especially for our covenant children. We must never forget Esau, who, who gave up um, his father, who, who, rather, who grew up in his father's home and, and with his grandfather, and, and, and must surely have heard about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the precious covenant that he made with his people. But Esau, what? He traded it away for a bowl of stew. Now, Esau wasn't stupid. He wasn't tricked by his brother. He just didn't see the value to his birthright as the firstborn and the protector of the faith of the family. The kingdom of God meant nothing to him at all. The grandson of Abraham. If you haven't recognized the kingdom of heaven to be the amazing treasure that it is, if you don't treat it as treasure and live as if it was treasure, It'll be a lot harder for those around you to believe it is treasure. They're blind, they can't see Jesus, but they can see you. And if they see you treating Jesus lightly or very casually, or if you hardly speak, speak the name of Jesus in your home or open his word before your family and friends, if, if you treat your faith as a very private sort of thing, uh, if there's any excuse that keeps you, anything at all will keep you from appearing uh, at your church to worship him every Sunday. Well, how valuable, how important can Jesus really be? In other words, if Jesus and his word and his church and his promises, if heaven itself is not treated the way you would treat something of outrageous value, well, that's the way the world around you, your family and friends, will come to regard it. Nothing of value, just, just an old-fashioned cultural appendage to a respectable life, optional, light, valueless. Finally, a third thing we must see in these two parables. First, we need to identify the kingdom. What is it? And secondly, we must uh, regard it and recognize it as something of tremendous value the treasure, kingdom treasure. But finally, we must take hold of it at any cost. Notice in Jesus' parables, both men 
Let's say the first is a field hand, a, a farmer who's, who's hired to plow somebody's field, and the second is a merchant who buys and sells valuable pearls. But, but both of them, when they find the treasure, uh, not only identify it and recognize its value, but they sell everything they have to acquire it for themselves. You notice that, I'm sure. Uh, now, we may all very legitimately possess other things and desire other things and work for other things, but not more than the kingdom you don't desire it or work for it. Um, for the kingdom, uh, we must be willing to do anything. Anything less than that is faithless idolatry. Uh, think about this. What do the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, the Roman centurion Cornelius, and the pearl merchant in our parable have in common? The answer is, they were all actually seeking spiritual truth. They were spiritually, what we call spiritually interested people. They were not saved people initially. They did not possess the kingdom until they took hold of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they were looking for him. Now, the Apostle Paul, on the other hand, uh, while he may have counted himself a religious man, had a pretty high opinion of himself, and he was really not seeking the kingdom. Uh, he, in fact, was seeking to destroy the kingdom. He was an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God found him just the way God found the Ethiopian and the centurion. And having been found, having Jesus set before him, they all laid hold boldly. And they were willing to give anything for him. That's the point of Jesus' parable. And the Apostle Paul understood this perfectly writing to the church in Philippi. He says this, he says, but, but whatever is to my profit. Now, remember, the Apostle Paul was a man of, of intellect and a distinction, well-educated and perhaps well-off. But he says, whatever was to my profit, I, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost everything. I count them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. By way of contrast, think about the rich young ruler, the rich young man, who comes to Jesus and asks what he must do to get eternal life. Now, here's a man who has some interest in the kingdom, and it turns out that he lived a pretty good uh, lifestyle by way of achieving it, as he thought possible. But when Jesus fingers the one great obstacle idol of his heart and tells him to get the kingdom, the treasure, well, he'll have to give up that one thing most important to him than anything else, which is his wealth and his comfort, and he's not willing to do it. He goes away sad, but not so sad that he's willing to follow the Lord Jesus. Well, to say it, um, so, so, you know, this is, here's, a, here's an unbeliever uh, who's, who, who, may be, uh, who may be willing to give up a riotous lifestyle or a small degree of autonomy and, and comfort and respectability. He, he'll sacrifice that. He, he may see it in his own self-interest to do that. He may realize that a religious life is worthy of something, uh, but he's not willing to give up everything for it. Or to say it another way, there's only room for one person on the throne in your life. There's only one treasure. And if it's not the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's you. And if you love yourself more than you love Jesus, then you can't have the pearl, you can't have the treasure, you can't have the kingdom, and you can't have heaven. And that's just the point. And that's the fact. Jesus once said this, he said, no servant can love two masters. Either they'll hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot love both God and money. And I continue on the text. The, the Pharisees who love money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. You hear that? 
what is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Detestable because too easily it throws people off from the kingdom of heaven and too easily they throw it off for the pleasure of this age. Uh, if we desire uh, to put the kingdom first, to, we must be willing to give up everything for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what do you think the first commandment was all about? I'm the Lord your God, I brought you out of Egypt. Should have another God's before me. What do you think Jesus meant when he told us we're to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and strength? And what do you think he meant by this parable? To teach us that we must prefer Jesus God and his kingdom over everything. And if that sounds amazingly radical and demanding of you, well, that's exactly what it is. And uh, how do we do this in practice? What does it mean? How do we prefer Christ in his kingdom? Oh, well, practically speaking, we do it in a lot of ways. We do it when we prefer Christ by loving and preferring his word, the Bible, making time to read it and studying it over other things that we might do during uh, that same amount of time. We prefer Christ when we push other things away so that we're able to spend time to the Lord in prayer. We prefer Christ in his kingdom uh, when we make, the, make kingdom decisions that, that show our alliance to Christ. Not spending our money uh, on, all on ourselves, on our toys, and our vacations. Taking precious time that he's given us to talk patiently with one another, with children and family members about Jesus instead of chatting endlessly about a thousand other things. Grandparents. Grandpa and Grandma shouldn't just be taking the kids out for ice cream. Talk to them about Jesus. Let the parents do the ice cream thing. Spend time talking about Jesus, you see. We prefer Christ uh, by, uh, uh, by honoring and fearing God more than men, not being swayed by anti-kingdom priorities and the unregenerate lifestyle and opinions of, of friends and even family. We prefer Christ when we prefer to worship him on the Lord's day when we might do many other things, even precious things that are still less precious than the worship of God in his kingdom. Jesus said, anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Your father and your mother and your son and your daughter are not more precious than Jesus, as precious as they are. And they'll never be safe until you put them in line uh, in your heart uh, behind uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that, that true? So how is this possible? Honestly, I mean, having, having eyes to value something you can't even see, selling everything for Jesus, seriously? Well, the answer to that must be only by the saving grace of God. Outside of God's grace, you and I could never lift our eyes off of the fool's gold of this world uh, to even see real treasure alone, let alone identify it or value it or, or take hold of it. But guess what? Our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to make it possible. Jesus purchased the kingdom, the treasure, the pearl of great price and freely gives it to us who can never even see it or have it outside of his grace. You absolutely must seek the treasure of the kingdom. You must desire the kingdom more than anything else. You must get this pearl. And if you say in your heart, well, I can't possibly want it, well, then ask God to make you want it. You can pray, can't you? You can say, Lord, I don't have this kind of desire. I want this desire. Will you give that to me at least? And you know what, he will. You need to believe in the Lord. You need to repent of your proud unbelief and ask him to save you and, and to keep you. This is not an invitation. I don't give invitations. I share gospel commands. 
And the command found repeatedly throughout the Bible is to repent of proud unbelief and self-sufficiency and poor judgment and ask Jesus to save you and keep you and set his eyes, your eyes upon him. But this command also comes with an assurance and a promise that the Lord himself came to secure for us on the cross. Jesus purchased for us the kingdom. You might even say he purchased us so that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, so that no sincere saving prayer will be turned away. Rather, no repentant sinner will be turned away as he reaches out for priceless treasure. Like the two men anxious to sell all that they had to get possession of the kingdom. Recognize it, value it, take hold of it every day. It's no sacrifice to give up anything for Jesus. O oh Lord our God, give us hearts to desire you greatly in a world that is filled with pleasure mania. Give us eyes for you and help us to grasp hold of you. Give us grace, Lord, to do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'd like to invite you to uh, turn uh, in your hymnals to um, hymn number 353, the red hymnal, 353. We're going to sing together verses 1, 4, and 6. kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who in finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Receive now upon your heads God's blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>